is lecture note 4b, Markets and Price Controls, which demonstrates the use of simple graphs to explore the effect of supply and demand shifts on the market equilibrium and covers the effects of price controls and taxes on markets. I list a collection of references that I'll use while creating my notes. This includes our text and many others. You're not actually responsible for the content of these other texts, of course. These slides cover some tools to determine the effect of supply and demand shifts on price and quantity. We'll also cover price controls with vivid examples of the minimum wage and price gouging. Finally, we'll cover an introduction to taxation. We can use simple graphs to understand the effects of combinations of changes, or lack of changes, in supply and demand. There's nine possible combinations and nine possible outcomes. I'll show these in the coming slides with pictures you, you might draw. The goal here is not to memorize the outcomes or the graphs. The goal is to understand that you can draw pictures to discover the outcomes yourself. You just need to know how to draw the pictures. When one curve shifts, you only need one picture. When both curves shift, you need two pictures, demonstrating combinations of big and small shifts. We'll see that shortly. Number one, if there's no change in demand or supply, the outcome's really boring. Nothing happens to price or quantity, so I'll skip the picture. It's just an X. Number two, if there's no change in demand, but there's an increase in supply, we get a decrease in price and an increase in quantity. Why? Well, here's the picture. An increase in supply along a static demand curve yields a decrease in price and an increase in quantity. If there's no change in demand, but a decrease in supply, we get an increase in price and, quantity, and decrease in quantity. Why? A leftward shift of the supply curve along a static demand curve yields an increase in price and a decrease in quantity. Number four, if there's an increase in demand paired with no change in supply, we get an increase in price and an increase in quantity. Why? Well, we see a rightward shift of the demand curve along a static supply curve leads to an increase in price and an increase in quantity. Number five, if there's an increase in demand paired with an increase in supply, we get an ambiguous effect on price. It might either rise or fall, and we get an increase in quantity. Here's why. The first picture demonstrates the effect of a big increase in demand and a small increase in supply. Quantity rises, price, price rises. The second picture demonstrates the effect of a small increase in demand and a big increase in supply. Quantity rises, price falls. Number six, if we have an increase in demand paired with a decrease in supply, we get an increase in price and an ambiguous effect on quantity. It could rise or fall. And here's why. In the first picture, the effect of a big increase in demand and small decrease in supply is that price rises, quantity rises. Here's the second picture. The effect of a small increase in demand and a big increase in supply. Price rises, quantity falls. Number seven, if we have a decrease in demand paired with a decrease in supply, we get a decrease in price and a decrease in quantity. Here's why. The picture shows a decrease in demand and a decrease in price as a result of a leftward shift of demand across a static supply curve. Number eight, a decrease in demand paired with an increase in supply results in an increase in price and an ambiguous effect on quantity. It might rise or fall. And here's why. The first picture shows a big decrease in demand and a small increase in supply. Price falls, quantity falls. The second picture shows a small decrease in demand and a big increase in supply. Price falls, quantity rises. And number nine, a decrease in demand paired with a decrease in supply results in an ambiguous effect on price, which might rise or fall, and a decrease in quantity. The first picture shows a big decrease in demand and a small decrease in supply. Quantity falls, price falls. The second picture shows a small decrease in demand and a big decrease in supply. Quantity falls, price rises. So what's the moral of the story? When there's multiple shifts, both the direction and the magnitude of the shift matter. The dominant of the two shifts is the stronger determinant of price and quantity. When you're trying to find the effects of multiple shifts, therefore, you'll want to draw two pictures capturing various size shifts. 
And now we'll consider the effect of distortions on the market created by government policy. These are price controls which come in two forms, price floors, which set a legal minimum on the market price, and price ceiling, which sets a legal maximum on the market price. And we'll consider vivid examples of each. First, the minimum wage, which is probably the most well-known price floor. We can have a binding or non-binding price floors according to whether or not they prevent the market from adjusting to equilibrium. We'll consider the effect of a binding minimum wage, a price floor set above the equilibrium. First, we have some definitions unique to the labor market. Labor demand refers to firms hiring workers. So we can think of the quantity demanded as the amount of jobs offered at a particular price or wage. Labor supply refers to the people who would like to work, the labor force. The quantity of labor supplied is just the amount of workers who are interested in jobs at a particular price or wage. When quantity demanded equals quantity supplied, the market is in equilibrium and there's no unemployment. So here's a picture showing the naturally functioning market, with market equilibrium occurring at the wage necessary to clear the market. Suppose a binding minimum wage is imposed on the market, then we get unemployment. Will increases in the minimum wage cause unemployment? Well, yes, if we believe the, mark, the, the model is a good representation of the particular policy in the particular region we're studying. And in actuality, yes, increases in the minimum wage typically cause some disemployment. That is to say, some people who were employed at the equilibrium wage find themselves unemployed at the higher minimum wage. Whether or not minimum wage increases ought to be pursued is a normative question, though, and one that I'll ignore here. But I will say that just because an increase might lead to unemployment doesn't by itself mean that the wage increase is bad for society. Okay, so the picture de demonstrates the problem. A binding price floor prevents the market price from adjusting downward and we get a surplus. The quantity of labor supplied at above equilibrium wages exceeds the quantity of labor demanded at the above equilibrium wage. And, and in this market, a surplus is interpreted as unemployment. So with any policy, there's winners and losers. Clearly, those employed before the wage increase who kept their jobs are happy at the higher wage rate. Those who had jobs before but are unemployed are unhappy. So now let's consider a vivid price ceiling example, price gouging laws. Many but not all states prevent price increases on necessities during a state of emergency. The idea is to protect consumers from exploitation in their vulnerable state. Economists typically argue that price gouging laws are a bad idea and I'll present arguments just because it's a colorful way of seeing the intuition behind market forces. So let's consider the market for ice bags, a good typically affected by anti-gouging laws. Here's a normally functioning market. The market for ice bags is in equilibrium before the disaster strikes. Now when a disaster occurs and a state of emergency is declared, a price ceiling is imposed on the market. The price gouging law prevents the market price from rising to its new equilibrium, and therefore we have a binding price ceiling. Here's a picture. We see clearly when there's a below equilibrium price, we get a shortage because quantity demanded at that price exceeds the quantity supplied. This creates inefficiency in the market, and the price ceiling does not allow the market price to adjust upward to a level necessary to alleviate the shortage. In reality, the problem is actually probably more severe than I depicted initially because the disaster probably also is a positive demand shock, which creates a rightward shift of the demand curve. So the actual situation probably looks like this picture here. Note the anti-gouging law typically allows price to rise only a little above market equilibrium, say 10%. But instead of producing the small surplus suggested by the quantity demanded on the left, we get a shortage due to the strong rightward shift of the demand curve. Now economists give many reasons against anti-gouging laws. One common one is the idea that the price mechanism, if left alone, would incentivize sellers from unaffected areas to flood the region with goods to the point that the supply shifts rightward as well ultimately allowing competition to force the price back down to normal levels. But the price gouging law prevent this effect from taking place by criminalizing the entrepreneurial activities necessary to bring goods in. And there's another issue, a rationing story, 
where artificially low prices have consumers not responding by conserving in their consumption patterns. So people overconsume, therefore leading to an increase in the quantity demanded that contributes to the shortage. Basically, the idea is that people with more mundane uses for the good, in the absence of high prices that might discourage their consumption, end up siphoning off goods that would go to those with more urgent needs. Okay, taxes create distortions on markets too. We can have taxes on buyers and sellers. We care about tax incidents, the manner in which the tax burden is shared among market participants. For a given tax, we'll think about whether it's a supply side or demand side effect. And we'll consider the direction of the effect. We'll think about the effect of, on price and quantity as well. Taxes on sellers don't affect buyers directly. The tax makes production less profitable at a given price and shifts the supply curve against the static demand curve. Clearly, this would be a leftward shift because it raises the cost of production so less is produced at every price. Graphically, we're walking back up the demand curve, leading to a higher equilibrium price and lower equilibrium quantity. Taxes discourage market activity. The quantity sold after the tax is lower. We'll define this later as a deadweight loss. Buyers and sellers both share the burden, and in the new equilibrium, buyers pay more and sellers receive less for every unit. Here's a picture that shows the effect of a 75 cent tax on sellers. We see the supply curve is shifted leftward. We get a reduction in quantity, we get an increase in price. What about a tax on buyers? Well, the initial impact of a tax on buyers affects demand. Since sellers don't have the same incentive to, produce, to, to provide for a given price, the supply curve doesn't move. But buyers paying the tax decide to demand a lower quantity at every price, a shift of the demand curve. So the tax on buyers creates a leftward shift of the demand curve against the static supply curve. As a result, we expect a lower quantity demanded at a higher price, and sellers get less for the product, buyers pay more total. And this picture shows the leftward shift of the demand curve caused by a 75 cent tax on buyers. Clearly, we get a smaller quantity demanded. The reduction in output creates a deadweight loss, which we'll define later. It turns out the effect of the tax on buyers and sellers is equivalent. In either case, there's a, way, there's a wedge between what buyers pay and sellers receive. It's the same wedge no matter if buyers or sellers pay the tax. All the difference is who sends the money onward to the government. However, for tax incidents, elasticity matters. When a good is taxed, buyers and sellers share the burden, but often unevenly. The tax burden is more severe on the relatively inelastic size of the market. In other words, whichever curve is steeper or more vertical corresponds to the size of the side of the market that will incur the largest tax burden. We'll see this in picture shortly. Elasticity measures the willingness of buyers or sellers to tolerate price changes. A small elasticity of demand means buyers have few alternatives and are forced to accept the price increase. A small elasticity of supply means that sellers have few production alternatives and are forced to tolerate the price increase. The side with the fewest alternatives bears the most of the burden. This picture shows relatively inelastic demand, a steep demand curve, so buyers have the greater tax incidence. And this picture shows a relatively inelastic supply curve, a more vertical supply curve, so sellers have the greater tax incidence.